All right, good morning, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, welcome to the University of Pennsylvania's first, I believe, first annual Can Prevent Lung Conference. As, as you may know, Penn does a series of conferences throughout the year on various cancers, and one of the newer um, strategies here is to separate out those interested in prevention issues for the various cancers. So there'll be a series of these for different cancers along the way, and this is the first one being done for lung. So we welcome you all. It's a small group this morning, so we'd like to keep things as informal as possible. Um, I'm one of the chairs of this conference. This is Robbie Schnall from uh, Psychiatry, who's my co-chair. Dr. Janet Audrain McGovern joining us, and she'll be speaking in a little bit. And then we'll have a brief presentation on um, some advances in radiology and lung cancer screening done by Dr. Drew Terigian. He'll be over shortly. He's giving a, a presentation over next door at the actual lung cancer conference. And then we'll briefly talk to you a little bit about uh, an online resource at Penn called Oncolink. And Carolyn Vachani, my wife, will give you a little uh, uh, heads up on, on that resource um, as she uh, helps run that website. So uh, without further ado, actually, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements to make, so let me make those now. Uh, we, the Abramson Cancer Center would like to acknowledge the folks that have helped support this conference um, through their donations and various foundations. And that includes Genentech and OSI, Toll Brothers Incorporated, Mr. Brian Efren, and Bunny and Philip Kendall, who've uh, generously supported uh, their time and efforts to helping making this conference get off the ground today. Um, you can also learn more about us at penmedicine.org and at oncolink.org. And certainly, you're welcome to contact us. We'll provide some contact information for us if you want to ask any specific questions. We're going to have a question and answer period at the end of the morning here. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to stay pretty close to on time because I know we've kept our slides fairly brief. Um, so there'll be time for questions and answers both during the talks if you want to raise a specific question about a slide we're showing or if you have larger topics that you want to raise. Certainly, uh, well, there'll be at least 15 to 20 minutes at the end to, to talk about those. Okay? All right, great. So I'm going to start off the morning by giving what we're calling Lung Cancer 101. Um, and actually, before I start, do we have a, this thing here? Excellent. I guess I should know how to use this, but green is the pointer. Ooh, that goes forward. And is there a pointer part to it, too? No. Separately? In this? That goes back. Um, this may just be a slide advancer. OK, we'll make two. Um, so lung cancer 101. So what I'm going to do this morning is really just provide an overview of lung cancer as much as possible. Uh, we're going to really focus on risk factors as the primary topic, um, but we'll run through some basic statistics, um, try and show a few pretty pictures to convey some, um, some issues related to, to risk factors. Um, and again, interrupt me at any time. Just holler out. Don't raise your hand. Just holler, because um, otherwise I may not see if I'm looking over here, and, ask, and we'll, uh, we'll get your questions in as we go. All right, so it's always, I think, good to sort of see the the incidence of lung cancer in relation to the other major cancers in the United States. And so these are the most recent data available from the National Cancer Institute looking at, at where we stand with lung cancer. So lung cancer incidence is, again, this is the number of subjects afflicted per year per 100,000 patients in the population. And this compares it to the other major cancers for men. And this is data that's accurate to 2007. So lung and bronchus, as you see, is the blue line in the center, is the second leading cause of lung cancer in men behind prostate cancer, but unfortunately the leading um, cause of cancer mortality in men. Um, and then the other major cancers, as you see there, are colon and rectum, urinary bladder, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and melanoma. Uh, the rate is about somewhere in the ballpark of about 60 to 70 cases per 100,000 patients per year in the United States. The, as you'll see that the trend line is going in the right direction. We sort of peaked with lung cancer incidence at least per 100,000 in the sort of late 70s and 80s, and we started to see a little bit of a decline, not a major decline, but a little bit of a decline um, in the United States. Now, the overall number of cases is actually in slightly increased only because the population, the number of patients in the United States, the number of people who live in the United States continues to increase. So as the overall population increases, the number of cases have increased slightly as well. Similar numbers for women. 
um, the lung cancer incidence, again, the blue line here shows that the incidence is about 50 cases per 100,000 people in the United States per year. It's the second leading cause of cancer in women behind breast cancer. But again, it's the leading cause of cancer mortality in the United States among, for women as well. Uh, again, followed um, behind by colon cancer, uterine cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, melanoma, um, and, and several other cancers which are at, at pretty low incidence which aren't shown on this slide. So just a very brief anatomy lesson as we show a couple of things. This is uh, a couple of diagrams just to, to uh, uh, provide some uh, idea of what the chest anatomy looks like. The lungs themselves, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, are um, in the center of the chest, the right lung and the left lung. They're joined by our, tr our trachea, our windpipe, which then divides up into the right and left. The lungs are surrounded by a membrane called the pleura, which is really a very thin double layer of cells that surrounds the lung and keeps it um, lubricated. Um, and the pleura is the main site of mesothelioma, the other major tumor in the chest. Um, and there's a separate conference on mesothelioma going on today. Uh, and when you see, look at things in cross-section, you can see that the right lung is a little bit larger than the left. That space in the middle between the two is where the heart sits. And then you have your spine in the back and your chest wall in the front. And lung cancer specifically occurs at really any parts along the way in the lung themselves or in the airways that connect the two lungs together. And just to show you a couple of pictures of what that looks like using both a chest x-ray and a CAT scan, most of you are probably familiar with what a chest x-ray looks like. Again, the, the right lung, the left lung, the heart sort of sits in the middle, and the shadow you see on the chest x-ray sort of in the center of the, uh, of the left lung, which is actually on the right side of the page there, is what is a frequent way that lung cancers present on chest x-ray. And then if we look at the CAT scan, that sort of spiculated spot, round spot, is a lung cancer present in otherwise normal appearing lung on the left side. So let's just jump into risk factors. And, and so the major risk factors that I've put up here are the ones we'll speak mostly about today. Tobacco use is, and so the percentages that I have after each risk factor is the proportion of lung cancer cases, thank you, it's the proportion of lung cancer cases um, that are Part, at least in part, due to that risk factor. So if you add all the numbers up, they're going to add up to more than 100 because some lung patients with lung cancer have more than one risk factor, which is our contributing factor. So these numbers don't add up to 100, but this is the proportion in the population where that, that, that lung cancer at least is explained, at least in part, by that risk factor. So the first one is tobacco use, clearly the most dominant risk factor for lung cancer in the United States and worldwide. We believe that lung cancer contributes to about 85 to 90 percent of all lung cancers, and I'll go through this a little in a little bit greater detail in just a moment. Occupational exposures, at least historically, have played a major role in the United States with asbestos exposure. Occupational asbestos exposure being the most common, the most important risk factor for lung cancer. Again, there are some other minor contributing factors. Um, exposure to heavy metals, and we'll talk at least a little bit about arsenic. Um, household exposure to radon is now thought to be the second most important cause of lung cancer in the United States as we've been able to control to some degree, at least to a large degree, the asbestos exposure that occurs at least occupationally with um, less use of asbestos in the United States and, and better uh, respiratory control measures. Radon has sort of slightly moved ahead of, of uh, asbestos as the second leading cause. And we'll talk a little bit more about radon. Outdoor air pollution and environmental tobacco smoke are important risk factors. They don't necessarily contribute to a large proportion of cases, but clearly the rates of lung cancer in the United States are higher in urban areas, and it's thought to be due to the exposure to outdoor air pollution. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about secondhand tobacco smoke and, and, and how that contributes. All right, so tobacco use. Tobacco use um, or cigarette use um, has what's called a relative risk of 10 to 20. And without getting too far into the math, the, the simple idea is that a relative risk of one is what we consider your baseline risk. Um, if we're comparing to a population of, of lifelong non-smokers, the lifelong non-smoker risk in the United States for lung cancer is about one in 100 to one in 200, depending on what statistics you look at. So even if you've been a lifelong non-smoker, there's a very small risk of developing lung cancer in your lifetime. So what a relative risk of 10 to 20 means is that if you've been a long-term smoker in your life, the risk goes up by 10 to 20 fold. So the risk increases from one to 100 to 200 to about 10 to 20 
for 100 to 200. So as you can see, it's a, a multiplication of the risk for lifelong smokers. The risk of lung cancer from tobacco use does vary, and I'm not gonna show that data in detail today, but does vary by the number of cigarettes smoked per day. So as you smoke more cigarettes per day, um, your risk increases, and it varies by the total duration, so the number of years that one has smoked. Um, and it does change with smoking cessation. So there's clearly benefits of tobacco cessation, one of them being to decrease your risk of developing lung cancer. Clearly many other health benefits that we'll discuss again a little bit later this morning. Um, um, other cancers, heart disease, et cetera. So let's just take a, a, a little look at some of the uh, data, and, and this may be repeated again, but we I think this is sort of important data to look at. We have made some significant strides in getting the U.S. population to smoke less, which is, I think, a very important health goal. As you can see, we sort of were at our highest back in the mid-60s, where approximately 50 percent and about 33, 34 percent of women used to smoke regularly. We're now down to about 20, 21 percent or so, um, and Robbie may present some better data on this because my data might be just a little bit old, but um, down to about 20 percent across the U.S. population. Now, this because this data can be looked at sort of both glass half full and glass half empty. We've come a long way, but we're still at 20 percent and sort of have a long way to go. Um, several years ago, going back a, probably a decade or so, some of the goals that have been established to, to get to by this stage was to get the U.S. population down into the 10 to 12 percent range. We clearly haven't met that goal, but we're going to talk about many strategies that have come along in smoking cessation techniques and strategies that we hope to get there in the next decade. If you look at the rates of, of lung cancer death and, and look at the curve for tobacco use as a, across the population as a whole, you can see some very impressive trends, though. As we have cut back on our smoking as a population, we've cut down on our death rates from lung cancer across men, and as we're just starting now to see a cut uh, in women's death rates as well. So clearly a very important relationship, um, and this remains our sort of number one um, public health priority in the United States at this time. Not just for lung cancer again, but for many other diseases. But this is very, I think, very easy to see what we've seen in the United States in terms of trends of both tobacco use and, and lung cancer death rates. No, I think that part of it is that men started off at a, at a higher smoking rate, so we've been able to see the trend in, in a lower death rate a little bit faster as men's rates have declined because they started off at 50 percent and are down to about 21, 22. The women's smoking rate was a little bit lower, so it's been a little bit harder to see this decline, but it, there really is, this is data only to 06, and if I was to show you data out a little further, we would continue to see a small decline occurring in women's death rates as well. Men did smoke more than women. Women started much earlier. Oh, sorry, much later. Men, men have been smoking long before World War II, and around World War II is when women really started to smoke a lot. Before. Right, so if this data went back this way, you would see that the rates were much higher for men even back here, and, and clearly very low for women, because they started smoking closer into the, the, the 50s and 60s. And then they've seen a decline as well, but the decline in men's smoking rates, at least over the last 40 years, has been a little bit more, uh, slightly more prominent. And so that's why we've seen a slightly more of a decline in lung cancer death rates in men than in women. Was there another question? Yes, I'm sorry. So this is, um, on this side, it's the age-adjusted lung cancer death rate. So this is a number of deaths per, of, from lung cancer per 100,000 subjects, per, excuse me, per 100,000 people in the United States. And on this axis, we're showing the per capita cigarette consumption. So this curve really relates to this axis here, showing that our consumption of cigarettes have, has gone down, sort of peaking again here in the 60s and has been slowly going down. And then this axis refers to these death rates, which show that male cancer death rates and female cancer death rates are starting to decline. Now, this is an actual death rate. So this is number of deaths per 100,000 people. Yeah. It's important to know that, that around the mid-1960s is when we had the first U.S. Surgeon General control on smoking. And that's why you see this, this change in smoking rates subsequent to that uh, reduction in death rates. 
and this is one slide that is also a little bit hard to see, but makes the point of, of how smoking cessation can decrease your risk for lung cancer. So what we're showing here on the axis is the cumulative risk, lifetime risk of developing lung cancer for long-term smokers. Um, so if you are a continuing to smoke cigarettes, it's the red curve, and you smoked starting in your early teens or 20s and smoked throughout your life, then your lifetime risk of lung cancer is about 15%. So you can see that that curve goes all the way up to right about the middle of between 14 and 16. So that is a number we frequently quote, that if you have been a lifetime long-term smoker, your lifetime risk of lung cancer is about 15%. Now what the other curves show is that if you stop, if you stopped at age 60, at 50, at 40, at 30, your lung cancer risk declines in concert with that. So if you stop smoking at 60, your, that your lifetime risk drops to 10%. If you stop smoking even sooner at 50, your lifetime risk drops to 6%, and so on and so forth. And if you are a lifetime, lifetime non-smoker, your risk of lung cancer remains very low, not zero, but somewhere in the ballpark of about half to 1% lifetime risk. So very low. But unfortunately, lung cancer does occur in, in non-smokers. The flip side of that equation is that about about 15% of the cases, 10 to 15% of the cases that we see actually do occur in lifetime non-smokers. All right, so let's jump to asbestos. Um, this is just a picture that sort of, I think, paints the, uh, the, a, a good idea of what an asbestos mine used to look like. So this is an asbestos mine in Newfoundland circa 1980. Uh, it requires really sort of stripping of the ground to be able to get out as the asbestos fibers which are present in the soil and, and, and mining of asbestos was quite common in, in Canada South Africa and Australia were the two largest, the three largest um, country, uh, centers for asbestos mining. But the United States was a, a very heavy user of asbestos products for insulation purposes and other purposes um, through this century, through the last century, um, leading to uh, certainly an increased risk of both mesothelioma and lung cancer. So what is asbestos? Asbestos is a, it's a naturally occurring mineral that is in the soil. It's, it's really based out of a, a molecule called silica um, combined with both magnesium and water. These molecules are very small, so this is only 100 micrometers in length, less than one millimeter. And these are what they look like. There's two main types of fibers. They're called amphibole fibers, which are the straighter fibers, and the one over here. And there's things, things called cristal fibers, which are more curvy fibers. These both, both of these fibers have similar properties in that they are very good at, at being fire retardants, at insulation, and so have been used, were used extensively in, in building, um, shipbuilding, and other construction type activities in the United States. This is what a fiber looks like inside the lung. So if you were to take a little wash of the lung, you can see these fibers are now being attacked by our white blood cells. So a couple different ways to sort of see this. This is a, uh, a high magnification view of a, of a lung white blood cell engulfing a fiber and, and essentially chewing it up and getting rid of it. The way that asbestos causes lung cancer is that the larger fibers, though, are very difficult to clear because they are long, and a single cell or even a group of cells can't, can't uh, digest an entire fiber, and so these fibers can persist in the lung, and they can cause inflammation and scarring and ultimately lead to lung cancer. These fibers can also then travel from the lung out into the lining of the lung, the pleura, which I showed you earlier, and that's how they cause mesothelioma. So I think I've said this already. Um, the other sort of major disease that's caused by um, asbestos fibers is a disease called asbestosis, which is fibrosis of the lung. That is a non-malignant disease, but can have significant respiratory symptoms. And so for anyone who's had prior asbestos exposure, we do recommend at least an evaluation by a pulmonologist at some point so they can be evaluated for the presence of, of asbestosis or, and to be sort of monitored carefully going forward for the development of cancer or mesothelioma. There are no formal guidelines on how to do this, but most physicians do use some combination of imaging. Um, and Drew will talk a little bit more about lung cancer screening shortly. Um, the lung cancer screening studies um, have used standard um, annual CT scans, and that's what we've adopted for people with, asbestos with heavy asbestos exposure as well to be able to monitor them going forward. All right, sir. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's controversial. So when, 
Yes, sure. So the question was, what do we consider to be asbestos exposure? And there are clearly different levels of asbestos exposure. When the, most of the studies that have been done looking at the risk of asbestos exposure in lung cancer have been done in people who are occupationally exposed to asbestos exposure. So insulators, shipbuilders, boiler makers, people who are around heavy amounts of asbestos for most of the day for many years as a part of their work life. Uh, we do know that um, there are lower levels of asbestos exposure that occur for people in homes where there's been friable asbestos and, and perhaps some work done where that could have been delivered into the air. Spouses have been known to be exposed to asbestos from the clothing of men who've worked um, as insulators and, and shipbuilders where that, where that clothing is brought home with very dusty asbestos material and then uh, leading to secondary exposure. And we know that there is an increased risk, a slight increased risk of mesothelioma and lung cancer in those folks as well. So what I can say is that um, if you believe you've been exposed to asbestos, it should be discussed with your physician. And that can be, um, hopefully there can be some attempt to sort out how much true friable asbestos exposure you've been exposed to over your lifetime. We certainly recognize that buildings that were built in, in this country throughout the last century, uh, up until the 80s and even the early 90s, may have included some asbestos products, primarily asbestos insulation. Um, and as long as those remain intact, they haven't been disturbed, perturbed, there's no friable asbestos products, uh, asbestos fibers uh, visible, we believe that the risk of exposure from those, from those type of exposures is very, very low, and we don't necessarily recommend doing anything about it. For example, many of our schools in the United States have asbestos insulation, and the remediation is quite expensive, has not been completed in most schools. Um, but the belief is as long as those remain uh, intact and, and, and haven't been disturbed, that the risk is quite low. But that should really, if you have any concerns, should certainly be discussed. And, and if the risk is, is, is enough and the concern is enough, it may require some ability to do some imaging studies to see if there's any evidence of prior asbestos exposure. Good question. All right, so we're going to jump to the next major risk factor, which is radon I mentioned earlier. So radon is an invisible gas that's produced from the natural decay of uranium. And uranium um, occurs in certain deposits around the country. It's present in soil and water. Um, and um, um, it's, it's, pr it's certainly an, an issue in our area, as we know that um, there are certain deposits in soil around the Pennsylvania area that is um, high in, in uranium deposits, leading to, to at least some release of radon gas. It's thought to be, the, as I mentioned earlier, it's thought to be the leading cause of lung cancer among non-smokers now, um, and the second leading cause of, the second leading contributor to lung cancer risk overall. Um, as I mentioned, residential radon is the primary risk to the population at large, and, and there have been so there has been some controversy regarding what the appropriate safe level of radon is in, in the home or in any sort of closed building. The studies that have been done um, have measured the amount of radon. Um, this is usually done in people's basements where there is very limited airflow and, and radon gas can accumulate. And what we know from, med from the studies is that a level above five or so, of, I think this is picocuries per liter, compared to a low level, and the low level baseline level is thought to be a level below 2.7, there was a slight increased risk of, of lung cancer. So what an odds ratio of 1.37 means is about a 35% increase beyond baseline. So if you have no radon exposure, you have a certain amount of lung cancer risk. If you have a radon exposure level of above 5.4, again, long, relatively longer term exposure, your risk rises by about 35% or so. So this is not the risk of smoking a pack a day for 20 years. Remember, that risk was a, re a risk of, of somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 percent when we look at it um, in terms of percentages. This is a relatively lower risk, but never, nevertheless, it's a risk um, worth knowing about. We are in Pennsylvania, and pr I think in most many other states, required to test our homes for radon, at least at the time that they are transferred from one owner to another. Um, and the risk that the, the recommended level that the EPA, I believe, has put out there is a level of four. And if you have a level above four, you should have radon remediation. Now, as I just showed you here, this, these studies have actually not used four as the main cutoff. They've used 2.7 as a lower end of normal and compared other things to 2.7. So the, the EPA has also put out a statement that if you have a level between two and four, you should consider having remediation done in your home. Um, so it's something to think about. 
I can tell you that I bought a home about five years ago and my radon level was six uh, when I had it measured. So I had a remediation um, um, system put in. It, basically what it does is that it's, a, it's essentially a, 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 an, a fan that pumps air out of your basement and up a, uh, a channel and just keeps air circulating outside of your basement so that the radon level falls essentially to zero. And it just, it's, you know, costs a few thousand bucks, but probably worth the peace of mind uh, rather than having a certain amount of radon exposure that um, does have some clear risk for lung cancer. I think there were some questions around this. No, so a level two to four. So the official EPA statement is a level above four should be remediated, but two to four is sort of left as a bit of a question, and should you should individually consider having a remediation performed for between two and four. It's not thought to be the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States. Smoking, Again, then radon? smoking then radon. Yeah. Asbestos is probably right in there as well, because there is there are people who've had asbestos exposure that's you know been heavy through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and we certainly do see a fair amount of asbestos-related lung cancer still. But if we're thinking about risk factors of, of today, what people are being exposed most to that causes lung cancer. Radon has probably moved ahead of asbestos just given the amount of success we've had in decreasing the amount of asbestos use and um, asbestos exposure with respiratory devices in the United States. So radon is thought to be the second leading cause in 2011. Now, yeah. Like yeah. It's thought to be like it's thought to be less of a risk because most apartments have a fair number of windows and the amount of airflow that occurs just by natural use um, allows for a good amount of air movement across an apartment. Uh, if you had, um, you know, if you were in a basement apartment with few windows and, this, and the possibility of limited air movement, it would be worth looking into. Does it come through the cement? Comes through the soil, sort of up from the ground into. Yeah. Yeah, worth considering at least having testing done. And can you do it yourself? Yeah, I don't. I, there are home kits available, and I would not be able to speak uh, in any in any expert fashion about how well those work and and those sorts of details. There are remediation. So if you just look, if you just Googled rem, radon remediation, you will find companies in Pennsylvania or, or Philadelphia. You will find companies that come out and do this. Um, with no problem. Most real estate agencies also know of people, of service, of companies that provide radon, radon testing and remediation. Okay. All right, environmental tobacco smoke. So um, this is, quote unquote, secondhand smoke exposure. Most of these studies have been done in people uh, uh, exposed to spouses who are long-term smokers. And there have been a few studies done in the workplace where you're exposed to secondhand smoke at work through, through whatever means where, uh, where smoking was allowed at work and you were exposed secondhand that way. The overall increased risk is about 20 to 30 percent. So again, not a tremendously increased risk, but quite measurable. The studies are quite consistent. Secondhand smoke, long-term secondhand smoke exposure does increase your risk slightly. So again, the, remember the baseline risk here is about one out of 100. So if your risk goes up by 20 or 30 percent, we're going to 1.3 or so out of 100. So it's not a huge risk, but enough of a risk that it should be considered. Um, uh, if you have family members that smoke, make them smoke outside, make them quit. If they won't quit, make them smoke outside. Again, most workplaces have gone to, to, to not allowing work, workplace smoking, so that has been less of an issue, but studies from, from a few decades ago suggest an increased risk in that environment as well. All right, family history. I think that this was a question that was provided to us prior to the conference that people were interested in hearing a little bit about family history, which is an important question. There have been a large number of studies done on family history, mostly defined as any first degree relative with a history of lung cancer. If you have a first degree relative with a history of lung cancer, your personal risk is increased by about 80%. So what we think of as a relative risk of 1.8. Um, the risk is higher if your relative was diagnosed at a younger age. We think of younger age as something less than 50, 55. The average age of, lung, of development of lung cancer is in the 60, 65 range. So younger relatives with lung cancer increases your risk of lung cancer. And again, if you have multiple family members that are affected, that also is a slightly increased risk 
higher than 80 percent, but an even greater increased risk of developing lung cancer yourself. Um, I think this is one of my last ones, so arsenic. Arsenic is a heavy metal that contaminates our water supply to varying, various degrees across the United States, also um, a known risk factor for lung cancer. I'm just sure, I'll tell you that the estimates for arsenic exposure and lung cancer risk are not well known, so I'm not going to give you a specific number. Um, but as you, I just sort of throw this out there out of interest. This is a, um, a little column showing what the various arsenic levels are like across the United States. This being very low, and as we get up into the reds and purples being very high, at least in certain areas of Pennsylvania and Ohio, West Virginia, we certainly know that there are to be pretty high levels of arsenic in drinking water and, and so on and so forth. So um, something to know about. Um, it does, yeah, based on this survey, which was done by the U.S. Geological Survey of, I forget exactly when, but I think 10 to 20 years ago, our immediate area is relatively in the clear, relatively. So other risk factors, this is my last slide that I'm not going to talk about in great, any great detail today, but there are specific genetic factors that are, have been looked to, into for some time with no clear idea of, of which ones really make a difference. There have been some suggestions of genes that are passed down in our germline from sort of family member, from parents to offspring that may increase your risk based on how we handle nicotine and, nico nicotine car and, and tobacco carcinogens. Diesel exhaust. This is, this is data primarily from the third world countries that suggest an increased risk from diesel exhaust. Pre-existing lung, di lung disease. So if you have emphysema or COPD, your risk of lung cancer is greater than just based on what we would think uh, based on your, your tobacco history alone. So there is some sort of combined effect about having lung problems like COPD and lung fibrosis um, that add to your risk from just the smoking alone. So something to know about, doesn't surely, shouldn't really alter your behavior except quitting smoking if you continue to smoke and being closely monitored by a physician, but otherwise um, questions regarding that. So I'm going to start here and we'll come to you next. So what is lung fibrosis? So lung fibrosis is a disease of the lung called uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, there are many different types of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, they can be they can be idiopathic, so no known reason for developing fibrosis of the lung. It's just where the connective tissue of the lung develops scarring and gets fibrotic. Um, certain people with other diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, for example, certain bowel diseases like Crohn's disease, um, can lead to an increased risk of developing fibrosis in the lungs. So there are known diseases associated with fibrosis, and then unknown reasons for fibrosis. But if most people who have fibrosis in the lung present with some pulmonary symptoms to their physician, like cough or shortness of breath, and they're found to have it. So I'm just raising that as a, as a second risk factor that could also contribute to lung cancer risk, and all the more important reason for people who have these diseases to quit smoking so that they can minimize their risk of lung cancer going forward. Was there a question? Yeah, so I'm going to leave lung nodules. I think Dr. Terigian is going to talk a little bit about lung nodules in the context of lung cancer screening in a, in a later talk this morning. What's the COPD? C sorry, so COPD, my apologies. It's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COPD sort of encompasses the spectrum from emphysema to chronic bronchitis. COPD is a disease of, of a, a non-malignant disease of the lung where you get destruction of lung tissue, by, um, some narrowing of the airways, increased mucus secretion, all related to prior tobacco use. And a question? Yes, yes. But uh, I guess the point I was trying to make was that if you have COPD, your, your risk of lung cancer is even further increased beyond just what we would predict from the a number of years of tobacco smoking alone. Okay. Very good. And, and lastly, dietary factors. I'm not going to touch upon this in the area of active research. There is some data suggest that healthy diets, lots of fruits and vegetables, can decrease your risk of lung cancer a little bit. That has been very difficult to study because people who eat lots of fruits and vegetables also don't smoke very much. So it's hard to know whether the effect is just a little less smoking, which hasn't been able to be teased out in these studies, or whether the fruits and vegetables really do have some sort of protective effect on lung cancer risk. Those things are ongoing, and we'll probably be hearing about those in the, in the future uh, if there are true dietary factors that are found to be either protective or, um, or at increased risk. So with that, I'll end. I may have already gone over my time, and 
I'm going to hand it over to, to Robbie for the next talk, uh, which is Quitting Smoking 101. Can we hold questions till the end? There will be another period at the end. There's going to be a question and answer period at the end. We're going to have about 15, 20 minutes at the end, and we can go through those. Okay, so Robbie Schnell. Right, thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about um, is a, a review of what um, we know to date about how to help people quit smoking. Um, so I think we all agree it's important to quit smoking. Uh, some of the reasons uh, that Anil talked about are obviously it's, it's risk, uh, it's in, it, it increases your risk for lung cancer. There's 4,000 chemicals. Many of these are considered carcinogenic. They're found in insecticides, nail polish remover, and toilet cleaners. But as Anil said, about 85% of lung cancers are attributable to tobacco use. But tobacco use also causes a range of other cancers as well as a range of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, so not only lung cancer. Uh, about 400,000 Americans die every year due to tobacco use, and secondhand smoke causes uh, 49,000 deaths each year, uh, primarily among children. Um, tobacco use is very expensive. It, it, it uh, costs the average smoker about $2,500 every year. And importantly, you know, we, we, the last few years have been uh, very uh, difficult for us in terms of our economy, and uh, we would all uh, look for ways to uh, help, help our economy, and uh, smoking is responsible for about $193 billion annually, $97 billion in lost productivity. This is work absences due to smoking and illnesses, and then another $96 billion in health care uh, expenditures. Uh, secondhand smoke condition and it additionally causes about $10 billion a year in health care expenditures. So it kills people and it's costing a lot of money. There are a lot of benefits to quitting. It's never too late to quit. The earlier the better, certainly, but it's never too late. Uh, overall, on average, non-smokers live 10 years longer than, than smokers do. Uh, as I said, the benefits of quitting are greater the earlier you can quit, but as Anil's slide showed with lung cancer risk, even uh, smoking up until you're 60 and quitting can translate into meaningful reductions in your lung cancer risk. So the benefits of quitting occur immediately. There are, there are very short-term immediate gains. Uh, your, your heart attack risk drops and your lung function improves within two weeks to three months. Uh, after a year that you've been quit, your risk of heart disease is lowered by about 50%. Five years after you've quit, your stroke risk is reduced to that of a lifetime non-smoker. Ten years after you've quit, your risk of many cancers decreases substantially. And Fifteen years after quitting, your risk of heart disease is equal to that of a non-smoker, and risk of lung cancer is about half that of a continuing smoker. So uh, you know, th hopefully this slide portrays a more optimistic a view of quitting smoking, that <laughs> the benefits can be uh, immediate as well as long-term and very meaningful. So just some basics about quitting smoking. Most smokers say they want to quit smoking. So it's not about wanting to or recognizing that it's important to. About 70% of smokers say that they want to quit smoking. And millions of smokers are able to do so every year. Uh, and you'll show the slide uh, prevalence data showing the drop from about 50% in the mid-60s to about 20% today. So that's millions of, of individuals who've been able to quit. It often requires uh, several tries uh, to quit smoking before you're successful. You know, Mark, this is Mark Twain's famous saying, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Uh, smoking, uh, is, it's important to recognize, is a behavior as well as a physiological addiction. It's a learned behavior. It's a habit that we've developed over decades to deal with uh, psychological issues. And it's also a, a physiological addiction that, that our, our, brain, uh, our brains are, are already primed to become addicted to nicotine and that chronic use of, sm chronic use of nicotine, continued smoking over, over years, changes our brain and increases the level of addiction that we feel from a, from a physical point of view. Uh, there are many unsuccessful quit attempts. Uh, people often try and quit cold turkey, and this is generally uh, an, unsuccessful, uh, an unsuccessful way 
to quit smoking. And one of the reasons why the quit rates have, are, are generally low is that most smokers don't uh, utilize uh, proven treatments, including behavioral counseling and uh, medications. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? Yeah. So let me talk about some of the ways that, that we know are effective to help people quit smoking. One of the most important ways is talking to somebody about it, talking to somebody who has experience helping other smokers to quit. So there are a variety of ways that you can utilize counseling. Um, you, can, uh, you can pick up a self-help manual. This is you know, a literature, a guide that describes how to quit smoking. You can talk to people on the phone uh, and get phone counseling. You can participate in a group counseling session, and you can, you can utilize individual one-on-one -on -one counseling. And these are quit rates that are compared to, to no counseling at all. So if you just quit cold turkey, just, uh, about 5 to 10 percent of people will be able to quit smoking. And this is about six months. Uh, this is quitting smoking for at least six months or more. And then as you go from self-help from sort of a basic approach to uh, helping yourself quit to utilizing telephone counseling, group counseling, and then individual counseling, the quit rates go up. Up to about 17 percent of people who use individual counseling are able to quit smoking. And it's important to know that, that the more the better with counseling. On the left hand you see uh, a chart that illustrates the length of individual sessions. And on your right side, you see the number of sessions. And there's a nice linear relationship between the, the, the uh, duration of each session and the number of sessions and the likelihood that you'll quit smoking. So if you have uh, uh, you know, just sort of no contact at all to less than three minutes, but if you go all the way up to each session being more than 10 minutes, your quit rate, some quit rate is about 22%. If you have eight sessions versus one session, the quit rates double from 12% to 25%. So the more counseling, the better. Now, what should that counseling involve? Well, we focus on, on four areas uh, within our, our counseling program. The first is recognizing danger situations. So um, you often hear smokers say, well, I was able to quit smoking for a period of time, and then I got together with my friends and I had a cigarette. Or I had a fight with my partner and I was just stressed out and I had to have a cigarette. These are, we refer to these as, as triggers or danger situations. These are events, internal states or activities that increase your risk of smoking or relapsing. So, the net, so these are being around other smokers, using alcohol, uh, around meals, you know, very common for people to want to have a cigarette a a after dinner. Then uh, we focus on, so we first focus on trying to help people recognize these situations and then developing strategies to deal with them. Then there's developing coping skills. So there's identifying and practicing strategies to deal with these dangerous situations. And we focus on the acronym um, AAS or avoid, alter, or substitute. So you try and stay away from tempting situations, avoiding them altogether. You try and alter them by changing your routine, making lifestyle changes or substitute by challenging your, your defeating thoughts and staying busy and rewarding successes. So this avoid, alter, and substitute approach to dealing with these dangerous situations. We also provide basic uh, information, educating yourself about the cessation process and benefits of quitting like the material I've just described, and, and also focusing on the idea that withdrawal usually lasts only for about two to three weeks uh, it peaks at about three weeks, and after three weeks, the, the cravings and withdrawal symptoms dissipate significantly. So it's a matter of focusing these strategies on the first couple of weeks after you've quit smoking, and it generally gets easier for people to maintain abstinence uh, going forward. And then uh, finally, we provide a lot of support. Uh, we, we provide support. We try and encourage uh, smokers to seek uh, support from their own environment, encouragement, and concern and understanding from people around them, joint support groups. This builds people's confidence. Uh, it helps you uh, talk about uh, the quitting and the fears that you have about quitting, your past experiences, what's worked for you in the past, what's not worked in the past. 
So identify supportive friends and family and uh, encourage them to help you in the process. Quit smoking with you um, and seek out community resources. In terms of medications, we actually, relative to other diseases, we have a, a fairly uh, low number of options in terms of medications that are FDA approved for treating nicotine dependence. We really just have three classes of, of medications. The first is nicotine replacement therapy, and we have five different delivery systems uh, for nicotine replacement therapy. We have transdermal nicotine patch, nicotine gum, nicotine lozenge, nasal spray, and an inhaler. And then we have bupropion or Zyban, which is a, a medication, and the newly approved medication, varenicline or Chantix. So I'll talk more about these. So um, this is a, a busy table, but what I'm trying to do is provide you with some, just a little bit of information about how you take this medication and what some of the advantages and disadvantages of them are. So you have the medications listed here on the left. The, the first five are, are your nicotine replacement therapies and then bupropion and varenicline on the bottom. So uh, nicotine gum, you take it for 12 weeks. Uh, there's, it comes in two doses. Uh, you take a higher dose if you smoke more cigarettes every day. That's CPD cigarettes per day. Uh, the advantage of, of the gum is that it, it treats this, this sort of oral ritual, uh, this sort of behavioral ritual of, of having something in your mouth uh, that uh, comes with cigarettes. Also, the advantage is that it, it can address what we call cue-elicited craving. So a cue is something in your environment or something within you that increases your desire to have a cigarette. So when you uh, are facing these dangerous situations, uh, the gum can be more effective at reducing withdrawal and, and craving during those situations than other nicotine replacement therapies. Uh, the disadvantages, um, a lot of people don't like to chew gum. Um, so, the, you know, it, the side effects involve, like, soreness of, from chewing, and that results in generally poor compliance. The nicotine patch is taken for, uh, for 8 to 10 weeks. Again, the dose is dependent on how many cigarettes you smoke every day, a higher dose if you smoke more cigarettes each day. There's better compliance. You know, it's easier to slap a patch on in the morning than it is to remember to chew a certain number of pieces of gum every day. And there are a few side effects. But the downside is that it's not very good at, at addressing the cue elicited craving, the situations that may increase your craving for cigarettes. Uh, the nicotine nasal spray and the inhaler, these are both uh, prescription nicotine replacement therapies. You can, the prescription is for six months of use. Um, the nicotine nasal spray, uh, is, is the advantage is that nicotine is rapidly absorbed. So, one of the problems with nicotine replacement therapy is that it doesn't provide you with enough replaced nicotine from your cigarettes. And you see that with the patch and the gum and the lozenge, but it's better with uh, the, the nicotine uh, nasal spray. And it also is good for addressing our cue elicited craving. The downside is that, that there are unpleasant side effects that lead to poor compliance. So. Uh, I personally don't like taking any kind of nasal spray, and I think a lot of people are, are, don't like taking nasal sprays as well. The inhaler, uh, the advantage of that is that it, it almost feels like you're smoking a cigarette. You're getting that, uh, that the oral ritual and the uh, sort of behavioral aspect of smoking that you, that you uh, are losing from, from cigarettes, uh, and it can also address uh, cue-elicited craving. But again, like the, nasal, like the nasal spray, it has unpleasant side effects and leads, that leads to poor compliance. The lozenge uh, is the final nicotine replacement therapy. It, you take it for 12 weeks. The dose is based on how soon after you wake you have your first cigarette. If you have your first cigarette within 30 minutes of waking, you take a higher dose. Yes, sir? The nicotine inhaler is still called electronic it, it is not. So, so the nicotine inhaler is uh, FDA approved. It's manufactured by a reputable pharmaceutical company. Uh, the electronic cigarette is not FDA, FDA approved, and it is manufactured by uh, various 
unregulated manufacturers uh, all over the world. Um, we, we know what the harms associated with the nicotine inhaler are, and they're, they're, they're very few, much safer than cigarettes. The e-cigarettes are completely unregulated. They've not been formally tested to determine whether they're safe for people to use, and we have no idea whether they replace nicotine in the same way that a cigarette does. Okay. Um, bupropion or Zyban, it's a pill, it's a medication that affects uh, neurotransmitters uh, that are thought to underlie uh, nicotine dependence. You take it for 12 weeks, it comes in two doses, you start at 150 milligrams and you uh, increase your dose to 300 milligrams. Uh, the, the advantages are high quit rates, uh, it reduces depression, this is also, uh, uh, bupropion is also the same as Wellbutrin, which is an antidepressant, and uh, depression symptoms are common among smokers and increase when you quit smoking, so it can, uh, it can address one of the consequences of, of nicotine withdrawal that leads people to going back to smoking. Um, unfortunately, there are side effects and there are a lot of medical contraindications. There are certain medical conditions and medications you can't take Zyban with. And finally, varenicline or Chantix, uh, it's the most recently approved medication for nicotine dependence, uh, approved in 2006 by the FDA. Uh, it's taken for 12 weeks. It comes in two doses, uh, 0.5 milligram and one milligram. You, you increase the dose over time. It's well tolerated. It reduces withdrawal symptoms. And it, importantly, it, it uh, addresses uh, the reinforcing effects of nicotine. So the medication blocks the nicotine receptors itself so that when you, when you do have a lapse, uh, nic the nicotine from your cigarette won't be able to fit into that nicotine receptor and trigger the kinds of reinforcing effects that we get from, from smoking. Um, there are side effects uh, to, to, to the medication. Uh, mo most, uh, most commonly reported ones are nausea, uh, insomnia, and there have been reports of, of depression as well. So here you see the the. Uh, sorry, sorry. One question. Yes, sir. Uh, just to check that the yeah. contact may go away when you're done the uh, first week of taking chantex. Yes, they do. Um, you know, so chantix has gotten a lot of attention uh, in, in the last couple of years. Uh, it's actually quite common when a new medication is approved and leaves the confines of carefully controlled clinical trials and enters the, the, the post-marketing phase of a medication. You see this with a lot of different medications. So there are two sort of uh, classes of side effects that have been uh, most focused on with, with Chantix. The one are the psychiatric side effects. So this is depression, agitation, uh, becoming hostile and belligerent, sort of changes in people's personality. A lot of those, uh, if there are smokers in the audience who've quit, tried to quit smoking, Many of people will say, well, that's what happens when I tried to quit smoking. You know, I become angry and hostile and belligerent and depressed. Um, so uh, it, it's somewhat unclear whether those side effects are linked directly to the medication or a mixture of the medication and withdrawal from nicotine. Um, when we've looked at the medication in, in clinical trials, there's been 14 uh, rigorous, carefully controlled trials comparing this medication to the placebo. You don't see any difference in placebo and Chantix treated participants in terms of these psychiatric events. It's only when the medication uh, entered uh, into broad use that people, any, anyone could, could see their physician and get a prescription for, for, for this medication. There wasn't any control over who was using this medication. That's when you s started to see these reports of psychiatric events. The second class of, of potential side effects that you may have heard about are cardiovascular side effects. So around the 4th of July weekend, there was a, a report uh, published. Uh, this was a meta-analysis. So this was a review of the 14 clinical trials comparing varenicline to placebo. And they looked at the rate of self-reported, that's important, self-reported cardiovascular side effects of the medication. So this is. Uh, yes, I had a stroke, I, I had a heart attack, I had angina pains. They, 
counted up the frequency of those events across the 14 trials for everyone who took varenicline or Chantix, and the same for everyone who took placebo. And they found that in the Chantix treated participants, the rate of those events was 1.1 percent. 1.1 out of 100 people who took Chantix had one of these self-reported cardio negative cardiovascular side effects compared to 0.8 percent among the placebo participants. So not a huge difference, uh, you may say, but when you sum across 14 trials, you have what's called a lot of statistical power. You don't need very large differences between the groups to find the statistical significance, and that's what they reported in that study. So that study was picked up by, you know, Good Morning America, the Today Show, the New York Times, and so forth, and uh, the publicity surrounding that uh, report was, was, was very high, and that led to a lot of concerns. Now, the manufacturer of, 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 of Chantix, Pfizer, is now reanalyzing their data for the FDA. The FDA hasn't, uh, hasn't required uh, a change in the label of the medication, uh, but, and, and on the other end, also contradictory to that result is they've also said, based on other analyses, that the medication is safe for people that actually have cardiovascular disease. So we're not absolutely sure what the meaning is of these cardiovascular side effects uh, from, from Chantix, but uh, it's going to be continued to be evaluated. And of course, smoking is related to adverse cardiovascular effects as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the context of a clinical trial, no. Um, in the context of anyone using this medication, uh, you know, uh, yeah, probably some. Uh, I think that uh, you should always talk to your doctor first and, and uh, be carefully monitored. I think, I think that if, if you're getting a prescription from, for genetics from, from your physician and you have people around you that would detect changes in your behavior, and could monitor you, then it's, I, I would recommend it for, for anybody. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I would add is that, you know, we, we certainly see a fair number of, of patients in our practice and the pulmonary practices at Penn who are interested in smoking cessation. And I think that our, our practice is still to use Chantix quite frequently. Uh, that's not to say that when we, if we see someone with a history of psychiatric disease, true psychiatric disease, or history of major depression, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that we do shy away a little bit, at least in the short term, from giving Chantix as the first drug that we would try until we see a little bit more about what the data is as it comes out. But for the large majority of the population, that is not the case, and so Chantix is still a very, very good option. Yes, ma'am. Um, so th there is uh, an ongoing study looking at that. We don't know yet what, we don't know two things. We don't know whether it's more efficacious for you, and we don't know whether it's safe. Um, so you wouldn't use the trial that was done on the pregnant woman? You wouldn't give them there's, there's no clinical data to suggest that it would be better, a better option or a safe option. And, and I think most people in the field are aware that there's an ongoing clinical trial looking at that and would probably wait for the data to come out to make that kind of recommendation. Uh, no, I agree with that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in just one minute, actually. That we have some data for. So uh, just, to, just to finalize on this slide, the sort of take-home message is that you can see on the right-hand side, Varenicline or Chantix provides you with the, the highest quit rate. This is uh, quit rate, uh, six, uh, quitting for six months or longer. Uh, if you take a placebo, most of these trials involve counseling, so that's why you see a placebo rate of 14 percent. And you compare that to the patch, the gum, lozenge, nasal spray, inhaler, uh, bupropion, or varenicline. So about a third of people who take uh, Chantix are able to quit smoking for six months or longer. About a quarter of, of people who take Zyban are able to quit smoking for six months or longer, and about 20% uh, of people who use NRTs are able to quit smoking for six months or longer. Oops. So 
This goes to your point. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work trying to improve the efficacy of nicotine replacement therapies. Um, so the first area that's been looked at is to increase the dose. Uh, we just finished a, a study where we're looking at uh, uh, increase a, a larger dose of nicotine. Uh, previous studies have found little evidence of improved efficacy. We found some uh, efficacy, um, but right now there's, there's no direct evidence that increasing the dose of NRT uh, is more effective than taking the standard dose. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at combining NRTs. So this is like taking, the, most of them look at taking the patch and the gum. So you've got the patch on to provide you with that steady state of nicotine, and then you use the gum or the lozenge to address these cue-elicited craving situations. And in general, those studies show that a combination is better than a single therapy. So that may be an option for, for you if you want to try. There's very limited, limited data comparing NRTs, and I would say that uh, this is more about personal choice than about the uh, efficacy of individual uh, NRTs. There, there's, there's really no data to suggest that one NRT is significantly better than another. And then uh, adding bupropion to NRT, there's very little evidence that, um, that taking NRT alone versus NRT and bupropion is any different. So I, I would say that, that that would not be a strong recommendation. Then there's, there's a good deal of research. These last two areas is more sort of recent areas of research. The, the first one has to do with using NRT pre-cessation. So uh, if anyone in this room has tried NRTs before, you know that the recommendation is that you need to quit first. So you start using your nicotine replacement therapy on your quit day. Well, there's, there's a good amount of, of reason to think that that's not as effective as using it before your quit day. So uh, some researchers have suggested, you know, use NRT for a couple of weeks and then work towards quitting. And there's, uh, there, there's always been some safety concerns about having too much nicotine in your system that can increase your heart rate and blood pressure and cause nausea or dizziness. Uh, from too much nicotine, but a lot of the studies are actually showing that uh, it, it boosts the uh, efficacy of these nicotine replacement therapies. So that's one option I think that um, is, uh, it would, I, I would recommend. And then the last is extending NRT duration. You know, if you remember back on that last slide, all these treatments really are for a short, acute time frame of 8 to 10 to 12 weeks. And uh, we've looked at extending nicotine replacement therapy and found some evidence that it improves, improves efficacy. So that's another option to, to think about. Um, you know, really, uh, the, 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 one of the main messages I want to I wanna emphasize is that medication and counseling is better than medication alone. Um, and this is, a, this is a slide that summarizes uh, data from numerous different different studies across numerous different counseling approaches and medications, and uh, th there's a significant improvement in, in cessation if you involve yourself in both medication and counseling than just medication alone. And then finally, you know, as a direct recommendation, if, if people in the audience are, are interested in uh, enrolling in a smoking cessation clinical trial, or getting help quitting smoking, here are two options for you. This is, this is uh, our phone number at Penn, uh, where you could uh, uh, talk with a, uh, uh, a research technician that will tell you about the different clinical trials we have and, uh, and uh, evaluate your eligibility uh, to enroll. And then there's a national quit line that hopefully people have heard about before. If you don't want to participate in a clinical trial, you can get uh, free treatment uh, through through the one eight hundred quit now phone phone number. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, one so the best approach to quitting smoking is not starting at all, and that's going to be the focus of. Uh, of my colleague Janet uh, O'Dray McGovern's talk.
Okay, as Robbie mentioned, the, um, the banner flying behind the, uh, the airplane is um, how do we prevent people from starting to smoke? Um, and it's uh, typically not adults that are just uh, picking up the habit. This is something that happens during adolescence. And I wish we had um, uh, all the answers at this point um, so that we could uh, prevent uh, much of the lung cancer that we see. Um, Robbie and uh, Anil in their, um, in their talks uh, presented uh, statistics. And as I just mentioned, um, smoking is a, is a big contributor to lung cancer as well as many other diseases. So if we did a better job in preventing smoking, we really could prevent um, not only lung cancer but many other diseases. Unfortunately, um, we have many adolescents starting to smoke regularly every day. So over 2,000 adolescents in the United States start smoking regularly. And that's not just experimenting with cigarettes, that's having at least one cigarette a day. Uh, many of those uh, adolescents will carry this habit well beyond adolescence into their adult years and um, go through many of the same things that Robbie talked about, the difficulties in quitting. So if we could prevent adolescent smoking and uh, we had uh, uh, dollars put into prevention, we wouldn't have to put so many dollars into um, uh, helping people quit smoking and then helping them with the diseases related to their smoking. So we have 1.4 million new smokers uh, uh, every year. So these are the adolescents that begin smoking uh, regularly. That, that's a lot of new smokers each year. That's what keeps the tobacco industries going. Currently, 20% of adolescents smoke. And when I use the term adolescent, um, I mean those uh, teens that are age 14 to age 18. Now, adolescence is a particularly vulnerable period to begin smoking for a number of different reasons. Not only social reasons, what's going on with the, uh, the adolescence world, but also what's happening uh, to their body, biologically, and, uh, and their brain. So when they try um, uh, cigarettes, their body may react in uh, a particular way such that they go on to try a second, a third, a fourth, and then eventually become hooked. The majority of adults uh, who uh, we've um, uh, encountered started smoking during adolescence. They'll tell you, I picked it up, I wanted to look cool, I wanted to look more mature, my friends were doing it. The majority of them began during adolescence and um, half of them were smoking regularly, probably addicted to nicotine by the time they turned 18. I'm in that group, <laughs> or I was in that group. Um, so the key um, uh, to preventing adolescent smoking um, and, and all of the, uh, uh, the, the diseases associated with it is to learn more about how to best prevent it. We unfortunately don't have all the answers right now, but what, what a, approaches have relied on in the past is what are the risk factors for, for adolescents beginning to smoke? So how do we tackle those risk factors? One of the things that we haven't done that we need to do a better job of is looking at those things that protect adolescents from beginning to smoke. So not only addressing the risk factors and trying to decrease them, but increasing those things that protect adolescents from beginning to smoke. Now, age 14 to age 18 corresponds to the high school years, so ninth grade to uh, 12th grade. Um, we see that some adolescents are already smoking by age 14, so these adolescents have an early onset. Each of these lines, if we consider um, uh, ninth grade to 12th grade, the prevalence or the number of adolescents that are smoking uh, doubles from age 14 to age 18. So this is a particularly vulnerable period of time, and this is a period of time that we've tended to focus on as well as the, the middle school years, so during early adolescence. 
we've um, seen a significant decline over the past decade in adolescent smoking. So it used to be that 36% uh, of adolescents were smokers by the time they uh, were 18 years old. That's, that's huge. Over the past decade, we've seen a significant decline. Now we know that about 20% of adolescents are considered regular smokers when they are 18 and, and uh, leaving high school. Some of the things that we think helped contribute to that is just an overall change in the, uh, the acceptability of smoking, but, but probably a larger thing is uh, uh, we put a kibosh on the, um, the direct marketing of tobacco products to adolescents in, in, in magazines that adolescents typically, um, typically read. The Joe Camel ads, the cartoonish Joe Camel ads were thought to contribute significantly to the uptake of smoking and the reason why that, um, that prevalence was so high. So in 1999, we saw some um, major restrictions put on uh, where tobacco ads could appear and um, um, really a, a focus on protecting adolescents from seeing those, those advertisements. So smoking uh, prevention programs have um, uh, in include a, a lot of different things. Uh, they're often school-based, which, which is a good thing because you have a captive audience. And I don't think there's any other uh, way that you can uh, reach such a large group of adolescents at one time. School-based programs have, include, have included um, information sessions, They've included uh, addressing social influences, and I'll describe uh, those shortly, um, and also life skill building. Community-based approaches to helping prevent adolescent smoking have included controlling access to cigarettes. So um, on the convenience store countertops, you'll see um, um, you know, big stickers or signs that, that say that uh, if, if you look like you're a teenager and you don't look old enough to smoke, then they're gonna ask you for ID. Also, um, limiting access to uh, vending machines, increasing the cost of cigarettes, all those were thought to, on a, on a public health level, impact an adolescent's ability to uh, obtain cigarettes. Also, media campaigns, such as the Truth Campaign, that used very, um, um, uh, flashy and emotional, um, emotionally charged ads to, um, to, to offer counter advertising to some of the tobacco advertising that was being uh, directed towards uh, teens. Um, some of the other community-based approaches involve um, uh, parents. And we know that uh, um, when parents, even when they smoke, if they have anti-smoking parenting practices in their home, um, and, and outside of their home that an adolescent is less likely to start smoking. Um, the community-based uh, approaches also uh, try to um, um, corral large groups of uh, adolescents through uh, community events, but I don't know that the, their reach is as great as uh, school-based programs. So if we want to prevent adolescents from, um, from starting to smoke, what works? What has been shown to prevent adolescents from smoking. Well, we know that the delivery methods matter. It can't, um, it can't just uh, necessarily be um, over a computer or, or necessarily over the telephone. It helps when you have face-to-face -face contact, when you're interacting with the adolescent. So you're um, practicing skills, you're role modeling, um, also, social influences approaches with, with life skills, those are important too. Well, what, is, what do those two words mean? Well, it means that uh, uh, we're gonna address some of the peer and media influences on adolescent smoking, because we know that peers play a very important role in uh, adolescent behavior, and we also know that the media plays a role. So, one of the other things that's important is adolescents tend to um, think that uh, smoking is a behavior that everybody does. And this is kind of a, just a general approach to adolescent thinking. Everybody's doing it, so I'm gonna do it too. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you let adolescents know, no, everybody is not smoking. In fact, fewer and fewer people are smoking. It's not the norm, then that has a major impact on, on whether or not they smoke. 
um, obtaining a commitment not to smoke and an intention not to smoke from an adolescent, and that's um, early on, is an important thing to do as well. And also to teach them how to handle um, offers for cigarettes. So that's called uh, tobacco refusal skills. So if uh, one of your peers offers you a cigarette, how do you decline um, that offer? And that's very important. In addition to those skills, life skills are very important. Adolescence is a very uh, uh, stressful, kind of uh, uh, rocky period where you have social changes, you have biological changes, and you need skills to, uh, to navigate that, uh, that world. So the, the things that would fall under coping skills like problem solving, making good decisions, how do I weigh the pros and cons of, of life decisions, including the use of tobacco, um, and how do I um, um, express myself in a, in a sort of way, whether it's managing a stressful situation or managing um, uh, an offer for tobacco. Those have been found to, to, to work together to help prevent adolescent smoking. Also, because peers have such a strong influence on, um, on adolescent behavior, the use of peers in delivering those anti-smoking messages and those anti-smoking skills and life skills is very powerful. Now, we also know, oh, yes. That's correct, um, and for a number of different reasons. It could be that the access to cigarettes is greater. They're around the house. It could also mean that through that family, there's a, um, a biological or a genetic predisposition to, to respond to tobacco in such a way. So if you're an adolescent and the majority of your life you've been exposed to tobacco smoke, and so you've kind of gotten those constituents, even at a lower level, it may be just easier for you to then uh, pick it up and, and inhale that direct tobacco smoke and then respond in a particular way biologically. So you may find it that much more pleasurable. Um, so there are a number of different uh, reasons for that. But we also know that even if you have, if you are a smoking parent and you um, engage in anti-smoking parenting practices that you're less likely to have an adolescent pick up smoking. So what does that term mean, anti-smoking parenting practices? Well, it means that you're not gonna smoke in your house. You're gonna smoke outside. So it's gonna be raining, it's gonna be snowing, it's gonna be ugly weather, but you're showing your adolescent, this is a really inconvenient habit I have. And this is really, I, I have to stop from watching my television show to go outside and smoke. This is a hard thing. You see how it interrupts my life. No smoking in the car. When you have people come over to your house, you ask them to smoke outside. Um, so these are, these are letting your, your behavior do even more of the talking. Because when you just say, smoking's bad, don't do it, that's inconsistent with actually what your behavior is. So if you show them how inconvenient it is and how much you wish you had not started to smoke, that's important, along with telling them that you don't approve if they started smoking. It's, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not what the majority of people are doing. Um, then, then that goes a long way. Um, so what doesn't work? Well, information only um, doesn't work. So if um, you only provide, say, graphic evidence of the harms of smoking. That's what they did when I was going through school. I can say that that, that doesn't work. Um, when you have a small number of sessions, and small means less than 15, um, that tends not to be as helpful. If these sessions occur in, occur in early adolescence, say 12, 13 years old, but these messages and these skills um, are not repeated during, say, the high school years, um, then those programs tend to be less effective. If the prevention intervention is given by the, the teacher in the classroom, those are less effective. The reason why is, well, teachers have so many other things to do. 
the relationships probably vary with their adolescent, their, their students in their class. Um, but this is not, um, even if they have um, training in the delivery of these messages, there could be variability there. There's so many other things for them to do. And teachers really aren't health behavior change um, um, experts. One day special events, poster competitions, lotteries, thing, um, uh, things that really are of low intensity have found not to be helpful. Now, we know that even when we put our best approaches forward, our, um, we're able to prevent about half of adolescents from starting to smoke. So what that means is we still have a lot of work to do. How do we get that number up from 50% to 80% to maybe close to 100% one day? Well, there are many things that, uh, that we could do. Um, we could address the timing of the prevention interventions the content, the type, and also which adolescents are targeted. Now, this graph um, shows uh, a number of different things. And the point here is, it's an obvious point, but it's not how we've delivered interventions in the past. That adolescents do not all start smoking at the same time. They don't um, smoke. Um, uh, with the same frequency or with the same intensity, but the way we deliver our prevention programs actually assumes that. So we see here, if we start at the, um, uh, at, uh, the one here, when adolescents are age 14, some adolescents are already smoking. What is varying across time is how much they're smoking, but they're smoking regularly. If we look at the red line, there should actually only be one there, I'm not seeing double. <laughs> um, that those are adolescents that never pick up smoking. But the most important group here is this, this blue line that steadily increases. That's about 30% of the samples that, uh, um, that, that we study. And that's the group that is smoking more regularly. But what happens when we don't uh, conduct smoking prevention interventions at the high school level is we don't hit this most important group. And we're only gonna hit the group that tends to start smoking earlier when we conduct these prevention interventions in the middle schools. So we need to not only have them at the early adolescent level, but also later adolescents, so we can actually um, help some of these ado other adolescents. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, for example, we, we know that um, Hispanic males are very similar to, um, uh, to white males and females with when they start smoking and their escalation. Uh, the group that, uh, that differs is African-American adolescents. They start experimenting later um, trying out cigarettes um, and their transition into regular use is much later than um, uh, Hispanic adolescents or, or white adolescents. But by the time they reach young adulthood, they, um, they smoke regularly. And those adolescents have, or those, those individuals will go on to smoke uh, regularly and they have a disproportionate burden of the smoking attributable diseases. And that's something that we don't have um, we don't understand why that happens and how best to prevent that. Um, there, there needs to be a lot more research there so that we can address and prevent that, uh, that the uptake at that point and then the disproportionate um, smoking attributable disease burden that they do experience. Right, so, but when they were 14 years old, they were smoking uh, over 400 cigarettes a month. So if you divide that by 30 days, you get a sense of how many they may be smoking each day. And then they have a drastic uh, decline, so by the time they're 18 years old, they um, are smoking about half that. You have a green line here where uh, at age 14, an adolescent is smoking about 100 cigarettes a month 
and that rises up and it varies and then shoots back down. So these are much smaller groups of, uh, uh, of adolescents. Um, so what is happening there is the, um, what's differing is their, um, their use of uh, tobacco. So if we had um, prevention programs and even intervention programs that, that got to these adolescents, we may be able to really make good use of when they are 18 years old and they've already had, they're now smoking half. How can we get them to then drop to none? I don't know that there's you know any one thing. Some sometimes when adolescents are going through you know high school, it's like wow you know um, um, I'm going to be going to college. I need to kind of clean up my act and uh, you know enough of this high school kind of immature uh, type stuff. Or it may just be that um, their parents know that they're smoking. Their parents say, hey, look, you need to. Um, not smoke for X, Y, and Z reasons, what help can we get you, or they try to quit on their own, or they may also be part of um, particular um, sports team. We know wrestling. Um, adolescent boys who wrestle are more likely to smoke so they can make weight because nicotine impacts body weight. So are we seeing some of these odd things in, um, uh, in those sports where smoking is used to... Um, to make weight. Okay, so the content. Um, as I mentioned before, our programs to date have really focused on reducing risk factors. Well, how do we reduce the impact of peer smoking? And how do we educate adolescents about the, the, the savvy nature of tobacco advertising so that they're not influenced? So we've really focused, we've taken a risk factor approach. And an approach that we haven't taken is how do we increase those behaviors that have been shown to protect adolescents from smoking? One of those is physical activity. We know that if adolescents who engage in higher levels of physical activity through this very important period are half as likely to initiate smoking and then escalate in their smoking. The problem is, um, across this period in time, smoking increases and physical activity, activity drastically decreases. So here you have a behavior that's protective against smoking, but yet it is declining. So we feel that if adolescents are helped to maintain a particular level of physical activity, then they're gonna be less inclined to smoke. What we see in these graphs, we looked at a study where we had about 1,400 adolescents, and we know that um, the bottom pink line is those adolescents who um, came into the study with a lower level of physical activity. Then uh, the white line in the middle are those adolescents who are actually um, increasing in their physical activity. And then the red line are those who are drastically decreasing. So for the pink line and the red line, we see that they start developing smoking expectations. So they start to think, well, smoking, that, that sounds like an enjoyable thing to do. I think it would help me manage my stress. I think it would help me relax. It would give me something to do when I'm bored. It would help me stay thin. A lot of, uh, a lot of positive <laughs> ideas about sw what smoking can do for them starts to develop. And what we know then is uh, a couple years later that they, they are indeed, um, they have an increased odds of, uh, of smoking. They're, um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. They are related. Um, so um, marijuana use is, uh, is highly associated with, uh, with tobacco use, particularly smoking. Um, also alcohol um, is uh, associated with smoking uh, as well. But I think with the marijuana use, if you see an adolescent smoking, they're also more inclined to use marijuana, and, and that may just be you're doing all kinds of uh, you know unhealthy things making you know a line of poor choices um, a comfort in uh, inhaling hot smoke 
Um, so if you, you know, have had that practice with, uh, with cigarettes, then it's not so difficult to, to do that with marijuana, but they, but they are related. When we divide adolescents based on their physical activity levels, we don't see any difference with alcohol. Because I think sometimes with sports, there's an association with alcohol, but we still do see a difference with, um, with marijuana use. And the group that actually has the most significant marijuana use is uh, the group that's declining in their physical activity. Um, just an aside, the group that actually is four times more likely to use smokeless tobacco is the group with the highest levels of physical activity. So they're, they're definitely not risk-free when it comes to tobacco use. It's just a different type of tobacco. Now, the, um, we tend to target all adolescents as if they were the same, as if they had the same risk, um, the same um, starting point with respect to experimentation and then escalation. We've kind of treated all adolescents the same. But we know that there are particular pockets of adolescents that have a greater risk of going on to smoking. One um, very obvious one is those who come from a smoking family. Um, but another important one is those adolescents who have depression symptoms. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they have a diagnosis of major depression. It just means that on some level, they have some depression symptoms present. When we look at our data of 1,400 adolescents, at every single point, starting at age 14, ending at age 18, adolescents who have some depression symptoms are twice as likely to be smoking. So 75% of our sample would not have a high level of depression symptoms. That's 75% of them. 25% of them have a high level of depression symptoms. But yet, so they make up a smaller portion of our sample, but they're twice as likely to smoke. So if we also looked at some of these adolescents who were at greater risk and addressed the reasons for their greater risk, then we may do a better job uh, preventing adolescent smoking. So this not only, not only addresses an issue of, you know, who should we be um, targeting or, or, or helping um, the most, but also the idea that our prevention programs cannot be a one-size-fits-all. We don't treat blood pressure in that same way. We don't give everybody the same blood pressure medication. Um, we don't give um, everybody the same medication for their diabetes, so we also need to think about how we prevent um, this particular adolescent behavior in, in that same way. We may need to um, uh, take uh, an approach that uh, one size does not fit all, that one size may only fit one. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Janet. Um, we'll move on to our, our next speaker. Dr. Drew Terigian is uh, an associate professor in the Department of uh, Radiology at Penn, and he's going to talk with us about cancer screening. He's doing double duty over at the other, uh, other meeting room, so thank him for his effort. Hello, everyone. Over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about screening for lung cancer and uh, the findings of the National Lung Screening Trial. Um, some disclosures first. I've received funding from the American College of Radiology and Imaging Network, or ACRIN, um, not only for the National Lung Screening Trial, but for some other studies that are ongoing, listed here. Also from Pfizer Incorporated for a study of pancreatic cancer using PET-CT imaging. Radiological Society of North America to study lung cancer uh, with PET-CT. And also a pilot grant through the NIH, uh, through Penn, uh, to study the systemic effects of tobacco use upon the human body using PET-CT imaging. So briefly, we're going to talk about why screen for lung cancer, would chest x-ray or CT screening work, and then the National Lung Screening Trial results. So why screen for lung cancer? As you may or may not know, lung cancer is the second most common cancer in the United States and is the deadliest cancer amongst all of them in the United States as well. The prognosis generally depends on uh, the stage or extent of disease, and so it was thought that the earlier you can detect the disease with imaging, 
you may be able to impact uh, outcomes. And also, as you just heard, smoking is an epidemic where almost one in five adults in the United States are currently smokers, 46 million people. It's the number one risk factor for lung cancer and the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. Altogether, there are over 94 million current and former smokers in the United States who are therefore at increased risk of lung cancer. Smoking prevention and cessation are, are critical to reduce the incidence of lung cancer. It's never too late to quit, and if you have quit, that's great. Many support services exist at Penn and elsewhere to help you. Um, however, because people are still at risk after quitting, there still may be a need to do some screening. So there have been many studies in the 80s that were performed to assess whether chest x-ray screening works or not. The quick summary is that it doesn't work to save lives due to lung cancer. And then there are many investigators who do some research with uh, chest CT scans uh, to see if CT screening uh, for lung cancer would, would also be beneficial. It's been shown mainly through research in the 90s and early 2000s that CT scans can pick up more lung nodules, where a nodule is a focal abnormality in the lung, smaller lung nodules, more lung cancers, and earlier lung cancers. And these findings suggested that CT screening may actually work to save lives from lung cancer. Unfortunately, none of these prior CT studies were designed with a randomized controlled trial design. And what that means is it could not, none of these could answer the question as to whether CT screening really could save lives due to lung cancer. Someone asked me to put in a slide about CT safety. So are CT scans safe? The answer is yes when used appropriately in medical setting. Just to give you some background, we're all exposed to radiation in the environment. And in, a, in one year's time, you get about three millisieverts of radiation. Millisieverts are just a mathematical unit of measurement. If you flew from here to the west coast and back, you'd get one hundredth of your exposure to radiation in a year. A chest x-ray is about three round trips of uh, radiation exposure. A standard diagnostic quality chest CT is about two years worth of radiation exposure, whereas a low dose chest CT, which is what is used in the NLST, is about half a year's worth of exposure. And it's been shown that, or estimated, that from getting a low dose chest CT, you have a one in 100,000 additional risk of dying from a future cancer. And that's added to everyone's general risk of a one in five risk. So you can see that the risk is actually very low. And I would just say that you don't want to do imaging unless it's absolutely necessary. And so in case you haven't seen one, this is a CAT scanner. This is the one we used in the National Lung Screening Trial at our institution. And a patient lays on the table and passes through the donut of the machine where there's an X-ray tube behind the scenes that's spinning, such that the X-ray beam traces a helical pattern around the patient. And that's why these are called helical CT scanners, which is standard for all CT scanners. Um, there's also a new technology called multiple slice or multi-slice or multi-detector CT technology shown on the right. Basically, what it means is that every time the x-ray tube passes around the person, you get multiple slices of data. And this technology has allowed us to scan much faster and with higher resolution, such that we can now image the chest in about five to seven seconds. Now to the National Lung Screening Trial, or NLST. This is a collaborative uh, study between the American College of Radiology Imaging Network and the National Cancer Institute. It was composed of two groups that collaborated together, listed here. An interesting fact, this study is the largest and most expensive randomized clinical trial of a single screening test in the history of United States medicine. Overall, cost about $250 million. In terms of the study design, this is a prospective randomized controlled trial where high-risk subjects would be randomized to either getting a low-dose chest CT or a chest X-ray for three consecutive years, and then were followed for outcomes. The participants in the study were of an older age group, about 55 to 74 years of age, were heavy smokers, as shown here, and didn't have any history of lung cancer or other uh, cancers. And the main question that was to be answered was, does low-dose chest CT screening reduce loss of life due to lung cancer by 20% compared to chest X-ray screening? There are also some secondary questions. That is, how does CT and chest X-ray screening compare in terms of saving lives overall? The incidence of lung cancer, lung cancer stage distribution, that is, which cancers are early versus advanced, medical resource utilization, quality of life and psychological impact of screening, and cost effectiveness. 
And then as a radiologist, when a participant would get a CAT scan, I would have to interpret it as positive or negative, and this shows you basically how I did that. Um, if a person had a nodule bigger than or equal to four millimeters in size, or other findings suspicious for lung cancer, that was considered a positive screen. Otherwise, it was considered as a negative screening test. And this is just to show you that 33 centers participated in this study, one of which was Penn. Um, 15 of the sites collected blood, urine, and sputum specimens as well from about 10,000 subjects that are stored in a central repository for future laboratory-based research. They're also uh, collected um, specimens from lung cancers that were uh, resected and also stored in the central repository. Recruel was fairly quick. It was uh, over 2002 to early 2004. 53, approximately 53,000 subjects were recruited, half getting CT and half getting chest x-rays. And the purpose of this slide is just to show you that on the right-hand column we have the general population characteristics and the middle column is that of the study subjects in the analyst T, showing you that amongst all characteristics they're quite comparable. Participants in the NLST were slightly younger on average than those in the general population and uh, were more educated on average and also less likely to be current smokers, but otherwise quite comparable. This just shows that the compliance of the participants with the screening regimen, whatever they were assigned to, was very high, greater than 90 percent in all groups in all years, which implies that the results of the study will be of high quality. And then what is the significance of, or how often did you have a screen positive test? So in the CT arm, 24 percent of the scans were uh, positive screens, whereas about 7 percent of those in the chest x-ray group were positive screens. And if you look over all the years, the chance of having at least one positive screen in the CT group was almost 40 percent compared to about 16 percent in the chest x-ray group. Interestingly, if you look at non-lung cancer related findings, uh, CT detected almost 8 percent of potentially important uh, findings but not related to lung cancer compared to the 2 percent in the chest x-ray group. And most of these were due to heart disease and kidney masses. Yeah. How many screens do you need to get one detected from what the criteria are? Positive screen means you have a nodule bigger than 4 millimeters or you have findings that look like lung cancer. And I guess the message I'm trying to show is that actually on this next slide, here you can see that these are all of the screening tests that were actually positive, 96 percent in the CT group were not due to lung cancer. And so that says that even though you have a positive screen, meaning that we detect something, the majority of those are actually not due to lung cancer, which means that the test is not very specific. That's the downside of this whole approach, and that's something we'll address towards the end of this talk. Same thing applied in the chest x-ray group as well. And I thought I'd show you some examples. So this is a, a CAT scan image of a patient, of a participant in our study. The bottom of the screen is the back of the person. Top of the screen is the front of the person. This is the right side. That's the left side. You can see the two gray areas in the chest. Those are the lungs. And I hope you can appreciate there's a white blob or nodule in the right lung. And that was a new nodule that showed up a year after the person enrolled in our study. This turned out to be a lung cancer. So this person benefited from getting screened because we picked up an early lung cancer. Here's a patient who enrolled in this, a participant enrolled in the study showing multiple nodules in the left lung and over, oh, thanks. It's great to have a pointer. Here you can see nodules in the left lung, okay. It's hard to know from this scan if they're due to lung cancer or if this was due to an infection. A year later you can see that they spontaneously disappeared, which tells you they're not due to lung cancer. Do you have a question? Well, what do you mean by test it? Right. So you can, it depends on how big the nodule is and what it looks like. A lot of the nodules we see are quite small. In fact, I'm going to show you another example. And so sometimes doing biopsies are not that simple. Also, there are complications that occur from biopsies. Um, one of the major problems just with any imaging technique is that when you see an abnormality, you can't always tell whether it's due to a cancer versus something else. In this case, it looks like it could be a cancer, but it turned out not to be, as an example. Right. So um, depending on how suspicious the nodules are, 
then the clinician, who is the primary physician, might order an additional CT scan, say, in three months, sooner. Or they might have surgery if they're really suspicious. Or they might have a needle stuck in this to get tissue. So it sort of depends on the patient and the clinician and them talking to each other. Also depends on prior studies, how, how has it grown or not, how fast has it grown. It's a lot of factors that go into it. It was done as per standard clinical practice, though, which is really the way it's done. Yeah, you have a question? You mean me, if I were the patient? Yes. Um, and, and what was the initial part you said? If I had... Right. You mean for screening purposes? Yes. So it's, it's a tough question to answer because you can argue, I'm going to show you the results of the screening, which actually shows that it saves lives. But the downside is that there are a lot of false positives, you see. And so it's not a fully answered question yet, and there are more analyses that are going to be coming out. So it's a tough question. Yeah. And uh, radiation get over So the more you, yeah, so radiation exposure, the more you get, increases your risk of, of future cancers. And that's why I suggest you don't get imaging or physicians don't order tests like that unless it's indicated. So, for example, it's always a risk benefit analysis. If you don't get a CAT scan to save radiation, are you going to? you know, potentially suffer from the complication of a pneumonia or some other disease you may have that you can't see versus doing a CT scan just because you feel like it. So there's always a risk-benefit analysis regarding the benefits and the risk of the imaging tests. And the risk is quite low compared to your average risk of getting a cancer in your lifetime. Right, right. So you needed that radiation therapy. And so, you know, you'd have to ask, well, what's the risk of not having received the radiation therapy and maybe getting a cancer? Yeah, exactly. Right. The good news is that most nodules are benign. Yeah, as, as I showed you here, about 96% of those nodules detected were benign. Yeah, so statistically, you know, you're off pretty well. Here's some other examples. Here's a... Uh, participant who comes in with a lung nodule on the baseline screening, a year later it hasn't changed, and this hasn't changed even in future years as well, and this is an example of a benign lung nodule. And then here's a nodule that was quite large at the beginning and actually grew on the follow-up scan, and this was removed. This turned out not to be due to lung cancer, showing you that just because it's growing and just because it may look like cancer doesn't mean it's necessarily a cancer. Here's a tough case. This is a patient who comes in with a tiny little nodule here, three millimeters in size. It actually grew to six millimeters in size and subsequently didn't change. And so even though it started to grow, it then stopped and this turned out to be a benign nodule. And then here's another patient uh, participant who comes in with an 11 millimeter nodule which grew by one millimeter in a year and subsequently didn't change and this turned out to be benign as well. In terms of the results of the National Lung Screening Trial, more cancers were lung cancers were detected in the CT group compared to the chest X-ray group. The incidence of detecting lung cancers were equivalent over three years of screening. And in fact, 367 cancers were actually detected after the screening period was completed. And this just means that just because a participant had a negative screening chest CT didn't mean that in the future they wouldn't get a, a cancer. And so that means that screening can't, for just one year wouldn't be sufficient. This is the key slide of the whole study. In terms of the outcomes, 87 lives were saved from lung cancer due to CT screening compared to chest X-ray, which equates to a 20% decrease in the uh, loss of life. And because of all the false positives, the number of people you need to screen with a CAT scan, low-dose technique, to save one life from lung cancer is about 320. This is pretty high, and that's the major limitation of using CT for screening. In terms of all-cause outcomes, CT uh, participants had an overall loss of life rate 7% less compared to the chest X-ray group, and that was mostly due to the lung cancers. In terms of adverse events related to screening, complications 
were quite low between both arms, one to two percent. Major complications after having a procedure related to the screening findings were also quite low, more commonly in those who truly had lung cancer, but still quite low, about 10 percent. And overall, only 16 uh, people in the CT group compared to 10 in the chest x-ray group um, died after having a procedure within two month period. And I just want to point out six people in the CT group didn't have cancer but had a procedure and died from it, which is a potential harm of screening. Yes? 16 out of all the people who had invasive procedures, and I think the number was 300, 400, 500, I think. I, I don't remember the number offhand. In terms of the distribution of early versus advanced disease, those who had CT screening and had lung cancer and on average had earlier stage cancers than at more advanced cancers, mostly with this type of cancer called non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common group of lung cancers. Those who had small cell lung cancer were not favorably influenced by CT screening. So that means that certain lung cancers are favorably influenced and others are not. Sure. It's actually associated with most of them, actually. There's a subtype of adenocarcinomas called bronchiolavular cell lung carcinoma that tends not to be associated with smoking. Smoking is classically associated, I think, with squamous cell carcinomas in general. But adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, small cell, all of those are associated with smoking. It's the most, you know, about 15 percent of lung cancers are not, uh, occur in non-smokers, but they can be uh, mostly of the, I think, adenocarcinoma type, if I'm not mistaken. And then if you look at the actual cancer, lung cancers that were detected by CT screening, 70% um, were of early stage compared to about 55% in the chest x-ray group, showing you that CT picks up earlier stage lung cancers. And most of these were adenocarcinomas compared to the other subtypes. And then from all these tissue specimens that were collected from 10,000 people who participated, these are available for future uh, laboratory research efforts in order to try and better figure out who's truly at high risk for lung cancer, um, in order to figure out who really should be screened with a CAT scan. Um, how can you tell the difference between benign and malignant nodules using a laboratory test? Or if a person has lung cancer, how can you tell which lung cancers are really the aggressive ones versus those that are indolent and won't grow very quickly? And this is just to show you that there was a high compliance rate of the uh, specimens that were obtained from those 10,000 subjects. And also patients who had lung cancers that were resected, tissue specimens are also collected from those and are also available for future laboratory-based analysis. And what's left to do? Well, what are the costs of screening? What's the cost effectiveness of screening? That's very important if this is to be implemented on a wide scale. What's the quality of life effects of screening? Does this change smoking behavior? How does this affect how resources are utilized? And then bigger questions. What are the policies going to be to recommend implementation of CT screening in a standardized method? When, what age do you start? How frequently should it be done? How many scans should you get? How do you integrate CT screening with other preventative measures and diagnostic and therapeutic uh, algorithms? How do you take these results and apply them to other populations, such as non-smokers or younger people? Um, who's going to cover the costs of the screening? Insurance? Will it be the patient themselves? Will it be the tobacco industry? Government? Combination of all these things? And how can we decrease the false positive? Uh, I'll answer your question one second. How can we decrease the number of false positive screens? And that's where these biospecimens will come into play. Yeah, what's your question? Does insurance cover the cost of No, no, this is not covered. And it won't be covered until some of these other questions, such as cost effectiveness and these things, are answered to see if it's feasible on a large scale. Yes? CAT scan is probably about $300. So the bottom line, it's been shown for the first time definitively that CT screening saves lives from lung cancer. The downside is that it's a high false, high false positive rate. Other analyses are still ongoing, and other questions about CT screening still need to be answered before this can be implemented on a wide scale. And I would just want to emphasize that smoking prevention and cessation are still critical to reduce lung cancer incidents and to save lives, and it's never too late to quit. And in terms of acknowledgments, I'm just one of many people who participated in this large study. 
This is the executive committee of the NLST along with the NCI who planned the study. I'm one of these many radiologists who help interpret all these studies from the 50,000 subjects. Many physicists involved, many committees involved and committee members, additional partners including the participants without whom we could have, have done this research. And so I want to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Well, it's actually not recommended yet. They're still waiting for results of these other analyses and then based on all the facts, these bigger bodies like the American Cancer Society and U.S. Preventative Tax Force and other agencies can come up with guidelines that are reasonable to figure out who truly should be screened, who's at high risk, and yet not break the bank because there's only limited resources. But until that data is available, there will be no recommendations. Right. So what I, what I was told is that it was expected to occur either this month or, you know, over this year. I don't think that's going to happen. It'll probably be another six to 12 months because a lot of these analyses are not that simple. Remember, you're dealing with 50,000 participants worth of data over eight years, and you have teams of analysts going through this data, figuring out, you know, the statistics. So it's not that simple, but it's being worked on, I'm guessing, six to 12 months. Yes. Right. So in f as far as other imaging goes, so M I do MRI as well. And MRI is actually not as useful to detect nodules in the lungs as CT in general. Right. Right. So there's another technology called PET imaging, which I actually also do a lot of research in. Problem is that also has radiation exposure. Uh, yeah, sometimes actually more. But it also has advantages in that you can look at the whole body, you can look at functional information at the molecular level, where CT looks at things at the structural level. And one of those grants I had showed you in my disclosures actually focused on using PET imaging, PET CT imaging, it combines both to detect and stage lung cancer more accurately. Correct. Correct. It's, you know, screening studies are not that simple. You could see that this was an eight year study at $250 million. And those studies, unfortunately, require lots of participants because to meet the statistical outcome, you need lots of, and it requires a lot of money to carry out a study like that. So starting a screening study is really not trivial task. Um, and then you're asking about radiation. Well, the PET scans actually have more radiation on average than the CT scans. If you think about other tests, well, chest x-ray has less, but it also gives you less information. MRI is very good for certain things, such as bone marrow, soft tissues, but not as good as for, for the lungs. Regarding blood tests, I'm not an expert at laboratory tests. Neil could probably answer better than I can. But I know people are doing a lot of research with this, and that's where this biospecimen bank is going to come into play. People are trying to see if there are markers in these different tissues that tell you who's really truly at high risk so that when you do get a CAT scan, you don't have a 95% chance of a false positive. Let me offer two quick comments. Um, I think it's, as Drew mentioned, this is a very expensive study. So it's unlikely that in the, in the near future, and looking out into the next 10 to 15 years, that we're going to see another randomized trial of, of screening for lung cancer. So. Ultimately, as policy decisions get made, as these various organizations, the American Cancer Society, the U.S. Preventative Health Services Task Force, the American College of Chest Physicians, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, those four organizations will in the next six to 12 months come out with, with their guidelines on whether we should be doing quote unquote mass screening for lung cancer. It's unclear to us at this point based on the fact that there are so many false positives, so many lung nodules that are found by CT screening that are not found to, that are not due to lung cancer, Ultimately, what the ultimate analyses show in terms of cost effectiveness, it's unclear to us at this point whether the recommendations from these societies is going to be towards doing screening at the mass 
population level or to, to forego screening at this point. So we will know that in the next six to 12 months. Um, and so that's sort of where things stand. We're a little bit of a stalemate now because there's clearly this information out there in the public and there's a lot of interest certainly amongst both lighter smokers and heavier smokers to move forward with doing screening. And while it may be beneficial on an individual patient level, if you are found to have a lung cancer and get it treated early, on a population level, there's many, many questions yet to be answered, primarily really revolving around the issue of false positives and all the bad things can happen that can happen to people with benign lung nodules and the costs associated with, with all of those follow-ups. So um, that is yet to come. So there are a number, I mean, the, the work around blood tests for lung cancer or really any cancer are ongoing across the United States in a number of different laboratories. There are actually probably 10 different blood tests that I could mention that are being developed for lung cancer currently. None of them have been tested in any sort of randomized fashion and none of them are ready to be used in any sort of clinical fashion at this time. There are, there are a couple tests out there that, are, that have been, uh, that are available commercially to be used when a physician orders them to be used in people who have a lung nodule to perhaps help them determine whether the lung nodule is malignant or not. But that data is only coming out now. And again, there are no official recommendations around the use of those blood tests for the use for the detect for the determination of whether a lung nodule is benign or malignant at this point. But those tests are all to some degree still in development. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, everyone that we see who has a, a finding, uh, we recommend have a physician who's managing that patient, uh, for whether it's for lung nodules, for any disease condition, in order to manage all the different aspects of clinical care, clinical assessment, follow-ups, ensuring that the follow-ups occur in a proper fashion. You know, I'm just one part of the team, and you need a clinician there managing with the patient all these things. I would say it's up to you. You're involved. Yeah, I mean, and, I think uh, that you've made the point that you have lung nodules and you're worried about it. So I think it's reasonable to see reasonable to see a pulmonologist just to get a second opinion and to perhaps come up with a an appropriate follow up plan for how this should be followed going forward. I think that's quite reasonable. Yes. How awful? I'm not sure what you mean. You mean like what's your risk of future? I got gotcha. you. I don't know. I don't have a specific number for you. Uh, it's known that radiation exposure during childhood is more likely to induce future cancers than when you're than when you're older because your cells are dividing, you're developing, you're growing, that sort of thing. But just because you got exposed doesn't mean you're going to get a cancer. And on average, all of us whether or not you had a CAT scan or not, have a one in five risk of getting a cancer anyway, all right? So these other things are smaller relative to that bigger risk that we all happen to have. But I don't have a specific number. There's a lot of research going on We're trying to figure out, well, how much radiation means you'll have this much chance of cancer, and it's not very simple. Most of the data is extrapolated from Hiroshima survivors, those who are at really high level exposure, and saying, oh, well, this fraction of, of the population got cancers, and therefore,